Welcome to the Crime Redefined podcast produced by Zero Cliff Media. Coming to you from the U.S. Bank Tower, high above downtown Los Angeles. In our podcast, we drill deep into forensics and criminal investigation from the viewpoint of the defense, as well as explore the intersection of the media and the justice system. Welcome to Crime Redefined, listeners, and we hope fans. We're excited to be back bringing you entertaining, informative, and interesting guests. Today's guest, Pat Wertheim, is no exception, Dion. He's been a police officer and most notably one of the foremost experts and educators in fingerprint comparison. And you know, fingerprints were originally considered the gold standard in identification. Then DNA came along and people said, well, DNA is the new fingerprint. And more recently, some would say, and even on this podcast, that digital forensics is now the new DNA. So there's been an evolution. There have been a few very high profile failings of fingerprint evidence. And of course, you have to ask if those are isolated incidents based on a particular individual or if there's a real problem with the technique itself. What comes to mind is the Madrid bombing where an attorney from Oregon was arrest- arrested based on fingerprints on a bag of detonators. The only problem is it turned out to be a false inclusion. Boy, didn't, didn't that shake a lot of people's faith in fingerprinting? I mean, that's a, that's a high profile. Um, I believe the technical term is F up. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that'll, that'll definitely rock the boat. Um, I'm curious. Hey, do you have any experience with fingerprinting? Yeah. I mean, a little bit back in the day when I would go out and investigate clandestine meth labs in, uh, Southern California, I'd throw a little bit of black powder around, you know, on, glassware or other suitable items trying to figure out who the meth cook was and you know lifted a few prints and sometimes matched them to people um but that's really the extent of it but today we've got the right man on board to shed some light on questions that i think we all have about you know the fascinating world of fingerprinting yes sir pat wertheim has been in the business since the 1970s and only recently retired though he remains very active in the field he's worked as an officer in a few different police departments and in crime labs in Arizona and Texas, as well as the U.S. Army Criminal Investigation Laboratory. He's also taught courses worldwide. Well, with that, Dion, let's see what kind of fascinating stories Pat has, both uh, from his time as a cop and from a fingerprint expert. And uh, let's just see what we can all learn from this treasure trove of experience that Pat has. Hi, Pat, and welcome to Crime Redefined. We're so excited to talk with an expert of your caliber today. Well, thanks, Dan. I'm glad to be here with you. Well, Pat, I want to go all the way back to the days of the bakery. Can you talk to us about that and, you know, your cops and donuts and all, all, how all of that pushed you into a career? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I grew up, my dad owned a bakery, so I grew up in the bakery. I got my degree in geophysics. and Basically, at the time, that was just oil exploration, and the oil industry was in a slump, so there were no jobs. But I knew baking, so I found a small town in West Central Texas, Kerrville, that did not have a bakery, and I opened a bakery there. And we did okay for the first year, and then one of the big supermarket chains put an in-store bakery Uh, in the town. Yeah, that not That'll do it. It did. But in the year that I was open, all the cops in town learned that the donuts came off the fryer at 4 a.m. So they'd start lining up at the back door at 4 a.m. to do a security check. And since they worked on a four-week rotating cycle, with in that first year, I had met every cop in town three times for their four weeks or four times while they came rotating through getting their donuts. And... uh, When I had to close the bakery, they said, well, hey, Pat, we've got an opening at the police department. Why don't you come work with us? And I thought, you know, I never even wanted to be a cop, never thought about being a cop, but I got a wife and two kids and I need a paycheck. So that's how I came into law enforcement. Um, A year or two later, the assistant chief said, Pat, we want to train somebody in fingerprints. Are you interested? And I said, sure. So they sent me to fingerprint training and the rest, as they say, is history. Here I am, almost a half century later, still doing it. That That's a great story. And uh, as a lesson for the kids out there, become a cop uh, donut dealer and you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You'll be, you'll be in the network. That's right. Hey, Pat, early in your career as a police officer, were you ever thrust into a big or high profile case 
that, you know, you kind of felt maybe you were in the deep end of the pool? Uh, you know, it was a different world back then. And we did things that you couldn't do today. And the cops do things today that we didn't know how to do or couldn't do back then. It was a different world. Uh, in Kerrville, I never really got into any big cases. It was a small country town. And I was there through 79. In 1980, I went to Plano PD. And that's a little different. That's a suburb of Dallas. And we had our murders and robberies there, just like every other big city. So following up on that, Pat, during your time as, as an officer, what was the most disturbing case or maybe experience that you had? As an officer, it's hard to say. My most disturbing case was one that I had as a civilian when I was working at the state crime laboratory in Arizona. Okay, let's hear about that. My boss got a call for a murder over in the little town of Thatcher. The uh, murder victim's name was Mary Ann Holmes. Um, Ann with an E and Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S. Uh, you can Google her and find all kinds of information on her killing. But the uh, murder murderer came in from several blocks away. We backtracked him a long way and stood and peeked in every window. But he brought what we would call a rape kit. Now, that's not the police rape kit, but right, that's right. a serial rapist will carry a gym bag or something like that in which he has ropes, handcuffs, uh, weapons, uh, spare change of clothes, whatever he has found it necessary to commit and escape from a rape. And he brought his own rape kit. He went around and tried and found a back door unlocked. Mary Ann was 29 years old. I believe she was a single mother with a five-year-old and an 18-month-old baby. He went in the back door, tied her up, handcuffed her behind her back with his own handcuffs he had brought, then tied her up with ropes, got the five-year-old out of its crib or out of its bed, and tied the five-year-old little girl to the front of Mary Ann. After the two were tied together, he used something, a knife or scissors, to cut their clothes off of them. And he bludgeoned Marianne to death from the rear while he anally raped her with the little girl tied to her front. Um, that was the most vicious, disturbing crime that I have ever seen. He did not wear gloves, interestingly. But he wiped down the entire crime scene afterwards. Um, everywhere I fingerprinted, it was nothing but white marks. And Marianne was not a good housekeeper. So I don't believe all of the wiping was hers. I believe the murderer wiped down. He had tripped behind her house and caught himself when he put his hand out on a water heater. And I did recover a palm print from the water heater, but it did not have sufficient ridge detail to make a fingerprint identification. Also, I instructed all of the officers and the medical examiner's crew that nobody was to remove those handcuffs but me at autopsy. And when I did, I was very, very careful and processed them for fingerprints. And I got the tip of the murderer's right thumb on the tongue that was inside the locking mechanism of the handcuffs. The handcuffs themselves have been wiped, but on the uh, tongue that was protected by the locking mechanism. Oh, that's it, that's ingenious. That's great. Well, again, it was not a uh, not a good enough print to identify, and certainly not the area of skin that you would find in aphis. So that was of little help either. This happened before the advent of touch DNA. When this crime happened, you pretty well needed a whole drop of blood or, or a fair amount of semen or saliva to get a DNA sample. And touch DNA was unheard of. So we did not get any DNA from the crime scene. My boss um, 
studied the knots, there were some very unusual knots used in the rope that he later identified as knots that a parachutist would use. DNA section tried to extract DNA from the rope where he would have pulled it tight when he was tying her up, but they were un unable to get any good DNA from that either. That murder still remains unsolved today. Well, that's that, that's a really heavy case. That that is dark, and there's a lot of ingenious investigation there. And it's uh, sad it hasn't been resolved. I mean, is this something you think they'll go back to with you know the latest technology and take another stab at it someday? Oh, we're still working on that. I say we, and I mean basically myself and the uh, DNA uh, supervisor who was yeah, in charge yeah. at, at the time. We re revisit that case occasionally. In fact, I had dinner with her in Tucson, or no, in Phoenix, uh, last November, and about all we talked about was this case. Um, the, the local police seem to think it was one of the local men, and I do not. I believe it was a cross-country serial rapist, someone like Ted Bundy. The local guys would not have known to bring a rape kit. They would not have thought ahead to bring their own handcuffs and their rope. They would not have thought to wipe down the scene. The shoe prints that we got, we uh, we photographed them. We took plaster casts of them. They were brand new shoes. There was no damage and no wear on them. And they were a size 13 that you could buy for, for under $20 at Walmart. So I'm sure that they were just a throwaway pair of shoes and his feet were probably much smaller than that, but he was he was using those shoe prints and leaving them for us to find as uh, fake evidence. Yeah, sounds like sounds like a pro. Yeah, he was. This is really thought through, and and every time he he goes out, he's he's learning from that experience and then upping his his game. It sounds like to me. I think your assumption is fair. I asked the local cop if he had done a vicaps farm, and his response is, "What is vicap?" <laughs> um, he had never been to a homicide class. He had never studied homicide investigation. I did the VICAPS for him, and we did not get any good leads from that either. This is a little bit of a good segue. You kind of touched on it earlier. Tell us, how did you go from being a, a police officer on the beat to a crime scene fingerprint expert? Well, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, assistant chief asked me if I wanted to study fingerprints, and I said, oh, yeah, I'll go for that. So they sent me to a class at, at Texas DPS Academy, and I came back and did the fingerprint work and the major crime scenes for Kerrville PD. When I went to Plano Police Department, their ID unit was only two civilian ladies, and they both quit shortly after I'd gone to work there. So I sent a memo up chain of command to the chief saying, hey, I know crime scene and ID work, and I'd be glad to fill in until we can hire replacements. So they reassigned me to the ID unit. Uh, that was in 1980, and for the rest of my time at Kerrville PD, I did most of their major crime scenes and their fingerprint comparisons. In 1986, I went ahead and surrendered the badge and gun and went civilian as the ID supervisor full time. I love the fingerprint work. I love processing crime scenes. I didn't much care for directing traffic at 2 a.m. during an ice storm <laughs> around a wreck. Understandable. Um, I did, didn't much enjoy fighting drunks either. So <laughs> doing crime scenes and fingerprint work was to me more challenging. And instead of putting drunks in jail, I was catching real bad guys, rapists, murderers, burglars. Right. Yeah. And so I stayed in crime lab work. I, I left the police department for four and a half years from 1996 to 2001 and taught full time and did consulting. And in 2001, I went back to Arizona DPS crime lab. In 2010, I went to the Army crime lab, uh, the Defense Forensic Science Center as the fingerprint instructor for Department of Defense with their crime laboratory people. And in 2016, when they shut down their training division, I came to Fort Worth PD and I just retired from there last, uh, the end of last year. So I guess the question is, Pat, with all of those uh, agencies you worked for, did you ever have a supervisor that you, that dealing with was worse than dealing with an angry drunk? 
Why do you think I change jobs so often? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I'm pretty I'm pretty irascible, and if I can't respect a person, I'm not going to work for him. Uh, the departments I went to uh, were were excellent, but they're when there's a change in administration, if I don't agree with the new administration, I'm not going to stick around and be a troublemaker. I'm going to pull the plug and find somewhere else to work. Speaking of maybe working with difficult people, Pat, as a fingerprint examiner, did you ever have a situation where a police officer asked you to do something unethical? And if so, how did you handle that? Oh, yeah. Um, I've, I remember one case where I was out of town on vacation when I came back. I found out in my absence a an armed robbery had occurred, and one of the detectives had bullied the ID tech into identifying two fingerprints for him so he could arrest the people he thought had committed the crime. Well, it wasn't these two people's fingerprints, and I blew the whistle on that real quick. Another time, I had a detective come in and ask me if I would stick my head into the interview room and say I had a fingerprint identification. And I said, well, but I don't have a fingerprint identification. And he said, well, that's all right. This guy's ready to confess. And if you give him just one little nudge, I'm sure he'll give me a full confession. If you just stick your head in the room and say you have a fingerprint identification, that's all I need you to do. And I said, man, I can't lie like that. And so he and I talked. What I did was I took a fingerprint card and wrote the guy's name on it. And he went back in the interview room, and I just walked into the interview room and dropped that card on the desk and walked out without saying a word. And as soon as the guy saw his name, he confessed. But, you know, I had uh, I had qualms about that and realized after the fact that that wasn't much different from just outright lying and saying I had a fingerprint identification. So um, I try to teach my students that if you're doing fingerprint work sooner or later, a cop is going to put pressure on you to lie or manufacture evidence. Don't do it. Um, the, the court decisions have consistently held that it is perfectly legal for a police officer to lie to a suspect in order to induce a confession. And um, if you studied the work of Saul Casson, He's made a career out of studying false confessions. And a lot of the confessions made that way are false. Um, and while it might not be illegal for a police officer to lie, the ethics of a forensic scientist are different from the ethics of a police officer. And for a forensic scientist, we report the scientific conclusions that we reach from the evidence, nothing else without bias for the prosecution, without bias for the defense. And sometimes that's a straight and narrow line that's very difficult to walk. You know, Pat, Mahal and I are aware of this uh, New York State Police Troop C scandal. I think it's the Shirley Kinji case and um, their shenanigans with fingerprints. How common are planted fingerprints? And can you share a case or two where there was an, you know, that was an issue or suggestion? Sure. Uh, that case was that was a funny case because David uh, David Harding was the one that blew the cover off of that one when he was bragging about it to the CIA. That's right. I remember uh, that. Yeah. Right. Right. Crazy. Yeah. Harding, yeah. Harding and Lashansky <laughs> were the first two. I think six of that troop went to prison. I think a total of 11 of them were implicated in the scheme, but they had a lieutenant and some sergeants teaching the new detectives how to fabricate evidence. For example. Oh, man. Go by a suspect's house on garbage day and pick up his garbage before the garbage truck gets there. Then go fingerprint the garbage and get some of his fingerprints off the garbage. And then go back into the fingerprint files and stick those into the crime that you want to charge him with. Oh. Uh, another cop that I studied in detail that had, had come up with a scheme was a guy by the name of Herm Wiggins. Herm Wiggins was a cop in San Diego in the 1970s. And he would talk to the homeless people, the transients, the vagrants. He'd call them over to his squad car. Hey, you, come here. I need to talk to you. 
put your hands on the fender. I'm going to pat you down for drugs and weapons. They pat him down. He'd get their name and date of birth, get a little information, and then he'd let them go. Well, he'd drive off a couple of blocks and fingerprint the fender of his car and lift the prints where they had put their hands while he was patting them down. And the next crime scene he went to, he'd slip a couple of those lifts into the stack of lift cars he was getting at the scene. But he would also be talking to the victim like, oh, Mr. Mitchell, you know, we're going to be fingerprinting here. We'll get this bad guy and he'll be explaining to you, Dion, about how he dusts and how he lifts. And as soon as you turn your back, he'll pull one of these lifts out and stick it in the sack he's taken. Then he'll turn to you as he's through and he'll say, now, you know, those lawyers, the damn lawyers are going to say that I fabricated this evidence. <laughs> but you saw me take these lifts. Would you sign these lift cards and that way you can testify in court that you actually watched me lift them? And you would sign all the lift cards you'd seen, but the extra ones he'd slipped in the stack, you would sign those too. Um, I talked to Jim Roberts. Jim was a, a retired fingerprint officer that caught the scheme. Jim told me that he was convinced Wiggins had fabricated, I think he said, 73 cases. Um, in the final analysis, it could be proved that he had fabricated over 40 cases. I believe Wiggins served eight years in prison for that. I caught a cop in southern Arizona fabricating fingerprints. He was lifting the fingerprints off of an ink print card, putting them on a lift card, and submitting them as if he had lifted them from a drug load vehicle. Um, I tried to prosecute him, but there is nothing in this world harder than prosecuting a crooked cop. Isn't that the truth? And I tried for five years, and I could never get him prosecuted for fabricating evidence. Was this just about padding, like, arrest stats for for uh, for promotion? I talked to the other officers that worked with him. His, his name was Jesus Durazo. And Durazo... The other the other cops didn't even trust Durasso. They said Durasso was too gung ho, that it was as if Durasso was on a holy crusade uh, to clean up the streets. That he was on a mission from God. He was too aggressive, and so the other cops didn't even trust him. And I guess he figured that since he was on a mission from God, God gave him permission to fabricate evidence. Huh? The the ends yeah. justified. He the had means. a reputation for stacking cocaine arrests on every arrest he made. And what he would do is he'd bring some old local drunk in for public intoxication, book him into jail, and then he'd go back out to his squad car and, oh my gosh, there's a bindle of cocaine in the back seat. Uh -huh. And he would go in, he'd write a report how he searched his car when he went on duty and the back seat was clean. And as soon as he got this guy out of the back seat, he found this bindle of cocaine. And he had stacked cocaine charges on God only knows how many of his arrests uh, before he got into fabricating fingerprint evidence. Well, Pat, in recent years, I would say, especially since 2009, forensic science in general has come under more scrutiny and probably rightly so in, in many cases. And one of the issues, of course, is, you know, the foundational scientific validity of the various forensic techniques in your opinion, with regard to fingerprint comparison, has there now been enough research to conclude that, you know, there is a sufficient scientific basis to uh, fingerprint comparison? Oh, that was established over 100 years ago. Now, you can't fault the defense community for continuing to attack. That's their job. My disagreement is that the, the academic scientific commun uh, community is pushing forensic science into the same pattern that DNA followed in the early 90s. Now, DNA is uniquely situated for statistical analysis. Fingerprints is not. Um, pattern matching in general is not. Fracture pattern matching or footwear impression matching or facial matching. These are areas of physical comparison that do not lend themselves well to statistical analysis. Uh, Paul Feyerabend, a philosopher of science in the 50s and 60s, uh, maybe before that, 
Feyerabend was famous for arguing that there is no one size fits all in science, that every science is unique and you can't take the rules in one science and apply them in another. The scientist that was the dominant philosopher in, in uh, fingerprints when I got into the field was Karl Popper. And Popper's philosophy was that science is distinguished by falsifiability. If a conclusion by one scientist can be proven to be false, it's science. If it can't be proven false, for example, astrology or palmistry, then it might be a pseudoscience, but whatever it is, if you can't prove that it's false when it's wrong, then it's not a science. Well, if you look at the erroneous fingerprint identifications that have occurred throughout the history of fingerprints, they have all been exposed by other fingerprint experts who have found the mistakes that were made and exposed them. Fingerprint identification is a valid science, and you don't need statistical probability to do that. But that's the way we're all being pushed. Um, I like the philosophy of Carl Hempel, a philosopher, a scientist, philosopher of the 50s. Um, Hempel said that science is the application of validated natural laws to provide explanations and make predictions. And that's exactly what fingerprints is. The validated natural laws are the, uh, number one, the formation of the friction ridge skin on the developing baby in its mother's womb. That provides the uniqueness of fingerprints. And the other natural law is the persistency of the friction ridge detail due to the structure of the skin itself from the dermis to the generating or basal layer of the epidermis, all the way up through the epidermis. It's the structure of the skin which gives us the persistent details that we use to make identifications. So if you look at Popper's definition, falsifiability, fingerprints is a perfect example of good science. If you look at Hempel's definition, that is validated natural laws that allow us to provide explanations, uh, fingerprints is a perfect example. What the new scientists in academia are doing is they're going back to Thomas Bayes, a 16th century statistician who uh, uh, is famous for Bayes' theorem. And basically, it's a probability theorem. And you can manipulate that to come up with a likelihood ratio, which is what DNA did. And they're trying to hammer the square pegs of pattern matching into the round hole of DNA and make us follow Bayes' theorem to come up with likelihood ratios also. And for that reason, I think, if no other, this is a really good time for me to retire because <laughs> I'm not going to buy I'm not going to buy into that. I want to ask, what do you think's behind that push? Uh I don't I don't know. There's always an agenda. And so I'm just always trying to figure out like what's well, the agenda. If you Why look, would... if I, I served on SWIGFAST, which was the scientific working group for friction ridge analysis, science and technology, or analysis study and technology. Uh, it was a group of 35 to 40 fingerprint experts, mostly from the U.S., but with foreign fingerprint experts who came along and, and met with us. And we designed the guidelines and the standards for the operation of fingerprints in the United States from the mid-90s through about, oh, 2020, uh, 2015. But here's the thing. That was fingerprint experts designing our own standards and guidelines. Now you've got the um, OSAC, the Organization of Scientific Advisory Committees. And most of those on the committees now that are making the rules and the standards are not practicing fingerprint examiners. There are some practicing fingerprint examiners who serve on the OSACs that um, are designing the standards. But you also have defense attorneys. You've got scientists from academia and scientists from other areas that are designing the standards. And th that's where the big push now is for the likelihood ratios and statistical analyses. You know, speaking of standards, we, we always hear with fingerprints, you know, 
the idea of points of comparison, 8, 10, 12, is there a standard number that is necessary to declare a match, or how does that all work? There is no standard number, and the reason is uh, clarity is just as important as quantity. Uh, in other words, if you've got a very clear print, you might make the identification with fewer points. The points are the ridge endings and the bifurcations, or the splitting ridges, okay? But on a very clear print, you might see some shapes in the ridges, some bumps on the edges of ridges, sweat pores in the ridges. A ridge ending might not just be a ridge ending. It might be a long, tapered ridge ending, or it might be a short, blunt ridge ending. If you have a lot of that really fine detail, what we would call level three detail, then you might be able to make an identification with less of the level two detail, which is the points and the, the ridge ending, the bifurcations. The level one detail is the pattern, whirl, loop, arch, that, that sort of thing. So when you're looking at statistical analysis, you're only looking at the level two detail, the ridge endings and the bifurcation. The truth of the matter is with a really clear fingerprint, a fingerprint examiner will also take into account the level three detail, the finer, more microscopic detail that matches throughout the print. So if I have a lot of that level three detail, I might be able to make an identification with fewer points at level two. On the other hand, if it's a terrible, no good, very bad smudge print, say left in blood slipping across a surface, and there's no clear level three detail, and even the level two detail is distorted, then I might require a whole lot more points before I would be comfortable with the identification. So it's a combination of the quantity and the quality of detail not just some uh, threshold number of eight or 12 points. Understood. That, that's a great explanation. It is. I was just going to say that's a great explanation. So then the question is, well, what's the minimum number of points that I've ever seen make an identification? The minimum number I've ever seen in a good solid identification was zero. I saw a fingerprint out of the state of Illinois, and it was a prohibited possessor case, a guy that was a convicted felon and wasn't allowed to own firearms. And the police had seized a rifle from uh, his vehicle or his home that had a telescopic sight. And on the curved surface of this telescopic sight of the glass, which had been scrupulously clean, he had touched it very lightly with an area of his finger in which there were no traditional points. But the shapes of the ridges were so perfectly reproduced that when you compared it to his ink fingerprint, you, you'd look at it and you'd stand back and scratch your head and say, well, hell yes, it's him, but there's no points. Dave Grieve brought that to the Swigfast meeting one year. And of the 35 or 40 fingerprint experts who were there, every single one of us looked at that print and agreed that it was a good identification, that it was correct, even with zero points. Does that open up a, in, in his defense, does that, is there an opening there? Because, you know, you hear like fingerprint points. So if I was his representing him, would that be an opening to say, well, you had no points? Can you be, can that be used? Your explanation, can that be used against you? Well, it course? might be. Uh, he pled guilty to the crime, <laughs> so it never went to trial. <laughs> You you didn't go in the room and, and drop your business no, no, card no, again, did you? No, no, no. <laughs> What's what are some of the most out speaking of court, what are some of the most outlandish things you've heard an opposing expert testify to that are just flat out wrong? I'm looking for a little inside the courtroom oh, here. Well, there was one expert in southern Arizona that was working for defense, and uh, we actually kept a running log on him, all of the others that were doing fingerprints. And when he would show up for court, one of us would try to go sit in the gallery just to stare him down because he didn't lie when we were watching him. Um, he would testify. I remember one case he testified was a, uh, a vehicle that was uh, stopped at the border coming across from Mexico with, I think, five or six kilos of cocaine under the back seat. And when the fingerprint or when the police processed it, they found the guy's fingerprints on all of these kilos of cocaine. The guy who was driving the car and he was the registered owner of the car. So he was charged with possession of cocaine. 
Well, this uh, other expert um, who we refer to as a witness having other reasonable explanation, but we normally just use the acronym. He testified that in all probability, these fingerprints had transferred from other surfaces. In other words, the real cocaine smuggler had touched the kilos of cocaine to other surfaces in the car, like the window or, or some other surface, and the fingerprints had transferred to it. The jury actually bought that and found the guy not guilty of smuggling cocaine. But now, hold on. Think about this for just a second, and you'll realize that if a fingerprint transfers like that, it's going to be backwards. It's going uh -huh. to be a mirror. Yeah, it was impossible. Absolutely impossible. And I have experimented with transferring fingerprints as a, as a form of fingerprint forgery, and it is damn difficult to do. And if you do succeed, you're going to have a backwards image. So that was one outlandish thing that I heard in court. I think one of my favorite questions I was ever asked in court is I had just gotten back from the Shirley McKee case in Scotland. Um, where I had uh, found that the Scottish Criminal Records Office had made an erroneous identification against a, a woman by the name of Shirley McKee. And I had testified in her behalf, and she'd been acquitted. And it became a big scandal over there. Well, I'd just gotten back from that, and I was testifying in a case down in southern Arizona. The defense attorney decided that he was going to show that I don't stay current on the literature. And so he said, well, Mr. Wertheim, uh, do you stay current on the literature? And this is on cross-examination. And I said, well, I think I stay reasonably current. And he said, well, when was the last time you read a book on fingerprints? Now, this was in, oh, probably around 2010. And I said, well, let me see. The book Ridgeology came out in 1989. Uh, that would be the last one I actually read. So he said, it's been over 10 years. Yes, sir. Well, do you read the professional journals? And I said, well, when they come in the mail, I kind of scan through them. If there's something that's of interest to me, I read it. And so he says, well, Mr. Wertheim, there's quite a case going on over in England right now, quite a controversy over a case over there, isn't it? And I said, uh, yes, there is. And he said, would you please tell the jury about that case? So I turned to the jury and I said, on the night of July 6th of 1997, an elderly spinster by the name of, um, and, and now it's, it's my name, uh, but I went into great detail on that case for 20 minutes, and he's waving his arms trying to stop me. <laughs> but I'm not going to turn and face him. I'm turning and talking with the jury. And I can see the judge kind of lean back in his chair, smiling real big. And after 20 minutes, I turned back to the defense attorney and looked at him for the next question, and he just kind of moaned, no further questions, and sat down. <laughs> so I, I phoned him later that well afternoon, and I said, hey, I just got to know. When you asked me about that case over in, in the UK, did you know that I was the lead defense expert in that case? <laughs> and he said, no, but we put on a hell of a show for the jury, didn't we? <laughs> Okay, one thing I got to pull out of that. We got to make That's sure good. our audience gets this. Um, witness W H having, and is it other reasonable explanation? Is that the yes. correct? Okay, that's a good. That's a good one. Yeah, that's the acronym we use to refer to that guy. And we started <laughs> collecting transcripts on him uh, to try to catch him in conflicting testimony, so that we could charge him with perjury. Uh, about that time, though. Uh, one of the fingerprint examiners who was uh, prominent down there in southern Arizona, Tim O'Sullivan, died. And um, Jim Wallace, another prominent examiner down there, went to, to uh, ATF. And the old group of us that had been trying to catch this guy finally broke up. So I don't know if he's still working down there or not. Well, Pat, another topic that's really come into vogue, I'd say the last five years with regards to forensics is confirmation bias. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that can skew a fingerprint comparison, at least potentially? You know, I, I will disagree with some of the others in this area. I recognize the potential for confirmation bias, and I 
will acknowledge that the research shows that it can have a major effect. However, I have yet to see anybody produce a list of actual real cases in which a significant number of them were influenced by confirmation bias. I mean, you can point out uh, Brandon Mayfield, for example, Oregon lawyer that was arrested for the Madrid train bomb. Oh, bombing. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you can say confirmation bias was present there. Well, yes, it clearly was. Okay, that's one case. Now, how many fingerprint cases have we had in the last hundred years? And let's see how many more of those had Jeez. confirmation bias or contextual bias. And the answer is we don't know. But from my own experience, I would say that the the percentage of cases in which confirmation bias or contextual bias have caused erroneous identifications is exceedingly small. Uh, I think we have a much higher accuracy rate than, oh, I don't know, doctors, for example. Um, but that kind of research hasn't been done. Dr. Etil Drawer is consistently doing research on confirmation bias and proving that it can have an effect, but nobody has actually studied the real cases to come up with any kind of an accurate or even a wild guess as to how serious a problem has this been in real cases. Uh, it can happen, but I don't think it's near as bad as it seems. Uh, I did a research project with Glenn Langenberg, oh my goodness, probably 20 years ago, in which we went to an IAI conference, that's the International Association for Identification, and we did several workshops on bias. Now, that's not the way we phrased the workshops. We set it up to where we were doing three workshops on verifications. And so each workshop was comprised of a classroom full of people, fingerprint experts, who were supposed to do some tests on verifying latent prints. And I had brought 10 fingerprint identifications for them to verify. And in the one of these was an erroneous identification. Okay. In the first group, we just said, here's 10 fingerprint identifications that have been made. And we would like for you to verify them. In the second group, we said, here are 10 fingerprint identifications that have been made by a certified latent print examiner with a good reputation, and we'd like you to verify it. And in the third group, I said, here are 10 identifications I made that I'm absolutely confident about and I've testified to, and we would like for you to verify them. And the first group, uh, everybody caught the erroneous identification, but nobody got particularly mad about it. The second group caught them all. The third group, one of the fingerprint women in that class came up and she almost scratched my eyes out. She was livid that I had tried to trick her with an erroneous <laughs> identification. But the, the, the thing is, not a single person in any of those three groups could be biased. I then went up to uh, Minneapolis where Glenn taught a college class in forensics. And we did the same experiment in his college class. And these were kids who were not trained fingerprint examiners. Okay. And guess what? It was very easy to bias them. Uh, but we could not bias the trained and experienced fingerprint examiners. Well, that's encouraging. That That is good to hear. Hey, you know, Pat, is there any way to determine how long a fingerprint has been present on a no. surface? And, well, uh, uh, let me back up. Uh, I can generally testify that fingerprints will not survive a thorough cleaning. And therefore, any fingerprint that I find on the surface must have been left after the last thorough cleaning of that surface. I was in court once down in Bisbee when a uh, defense attorney, he reminded me of Captain Bly. Uh, 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 what was the name? Uh, oh, the actor that played Captain Bly in Mutiny on the Bounty. Charles Lawton. 
He was a little short, roly poly guy with a bad attitude and thick lips. <laughs> and he, Description. I think he also played boy. Napoleon too. The same he actor. stood up in cross examination, <laughs> and the the prosecution led me through the identification. It was an armed robbery of a taxi cab, and the the fingerprint was on the chromium chromium door handle on the inside of the back seat of the cab. The cab driver had picked up a fare. The fare had pulled a knife and held it to the cab driver's throat and robbed him, and then jumped out the back door and got away. And they found this fingerprint on the back door handle. So I'm in court testifying to this fingerprint that was on the door handle. And the prosecution led me through a standard uh, direct testimony. On cross-examination, this little roly-poly defense attorney gets up and he says, Mr. Wertheim, is there any valid scientific way to determine the age of a fingerprint? And I was going to give him the same answer I just gave you. Well, I could say it was probably left after the last thorough cleaning of the surface. That's what I was going to say. And I got halfway through the first word. Well, and he screamed at me. No, sir, Mr. Wertheim, this is not a well something or another question. And he pointed at me with his finger like it was a pistol. And he shook it at me and he said, is there any valid scientific way to determine the age of a fingerprint? And I turned to the jury and pointed at the jury with my finger and snapped it like a pistol and said, yes. And this little lawyer actually fell over backwards on the floor. <laughs> and I immediately went on with the rest of my answer. I said, yes, I can say with absolute 100% scientific certainty that that fingerprint had to have been left after the manufacture date of that door handle. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> nice. And the lawyer got up. And from that point, he, he pulled a handkerchief out of his pocket and wiped his face off. And he got from that point on, he was very polite and very gentlemanly. He never tried to bully me again. And um, I didn't have to be an asshole. again. <laughs> we got along <laughs> great after that. Oh, man. Happy ending. Yeah. I, I'm curious to get your take on this, Pat. In terms of any technology that recently became available or is on the horizon, what do you think has is the most promising potential breakthrough uh, in the world of fingerprint detection or comparison? I don't know. I see all of the new research articles and all of the advertising for this piece of equipment and that piece of equipment. And I still prefer some of the old methods. Uh, I, I take the, up until the time I retired, I took the proficiency test every year for processing evidence. And I know the sequential processing manuals. I know you're supposed to start with this technique and then this and then this and then this. And yet some of those techniques, I know I can do better with just plain old black powder. But here's the thing. New examiners aren't learning how to use the black powder. They're using all these fancy chemicals. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying that most of the prints we developed could have been developed with fingerprint powder the same way I developed them 50 years ago, but they're using different chemical techniques now. And that's not true of all fingerprints. We are developing a few more. APHIS was a major leap forward because that allows us to come up with a good potential suspect to do our comparisons where there were no suspects in the case prior to that. Um, lasers have been very, very good. I have seen some equipment in some other countries. For example, when I was in Poland, oh my gosh, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, they had a, a homemade contraption in the laboratory there in Poland that was phenomenal at developing fluorescent, or I should say developing phosphorescent prints. And it is not unknown technology, but to the best of my knowledge, there aren't any laboratories in America that are using it. And they use it all the time over there. Basically, the difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence is fluorescence only shines when the light is on the fluorescent object. Phosphorescent means that the fluorescent lingers for a few milliseconds after you take the light off of the object. 
okay? So phosphorescent continues to glow after the light has quit shining. This gadget they had in the, the laboratory there in Warsaw, Poland, had like a fan blade spinning in front of the light and the camera so that the camera could only see the surface when a fan blade blocked the light and the light only shined on the surface when the fan blade blocked the camera. And so the camera was not seeing direct fluorescence, but was only seeing the phosphorescence. And that was the most amazing contraption. And they were developing some phenomenal prints with that. But I have never seen that thing on the market, um, much less seen anybody make one to use in the U.S. Super glue was a phenomenally good uh, technique when it came along because we can process some items with super glue much easier than we could with powder. But more importantly, it fixes the print on the surface. Dye staining the super glue has been of some benefit because you can sometimes see prints with the dye stain fluorescence that you could not see with the naked eye or with traditional photography. But a lot of the old powder techniques and a lot of the old photography techniques that I learned 30, 40, 50 years ago actually worked really, really well. And those skills have been lost for the most part today. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's I'm surprised it hasn't been adopted here. I am too. And there may be some of those gadgets around. I've seen the I've seen it published in the literature, but the only one I've ever seen in operation was in Warsaw, Poland. It was the uh, the, the federal police there, and they had built it themselves from scratch. Ingenuity, I like that. Hey, hey, Pat, what's Apple has changed from using fingerprints as ID on the iPhone to using Face ID. What do you, what do fingerprints now rank in the biometric hierarchy? I don't know. Um, the fingerprint scanners they had on those phones, uh, I've still got one on my phone. It's a Pixel 6. Uh, my old Pixel 2 actually read the fingerprint better than the Pixel 6 does. And a lot of places now have fingerprint uh, fingerprint access to the cash registers. I was in Wendy's the other day for hamburger, and the uh, person waiting on me put her finger on a little pad next to the cash register in order to open it. So instead of using card access to get into the cash register, the cashier puts a fingerprint on it. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I have seen some of the facial recognition technology. I don't have enough experience with it to know how well it works. I do know that the fingerprint technology on cell phones leaves a lot to be desired, especially when you get old like me and your skin is getting flat and smooth. <laughs> Well, Pat, you are obviously a renowned instructor worldwide. I'm just curious, what are over the years, what are some of the uh, the keys that you've developed to being an, you know an effective trainer? Practice, practice, practice. Nobody is a natural born public speaker. And public speaking is a skill that you develop just like any other skill. Testimony is public speaking. The classes that I teach, or public speaking. I cut my teeth teaching when I was uh, a young cop and the safety council of greater Dallas was looking for an instructor for defensive driving. And I thought, well, that's pretty good money they pay. I think they paid 50 bucks to teach a class back in the early 1980s. That was good money. So I went down and signed up to learn to teach defensive driving. And for, oh my gosh, four or five years, I taught a defensive driving class somewhere in the Dallas Metroplex area every Saturday. Well, here's my point. If you can teach 30 people defensive driving who don't want to be there because they resent the hell out of the fact that this cop gave them a ticket in the first place. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> if you can learn to handle those classes, you can very easily handle a class of 30 people who want to be there to learn about fingerprints. <laughs> That's well, a good boot I camp. also <laughs> tell my students that testimony is a form of public speaking, and public speaking is a skill you develop by doing. 
and it doesn't matter who you're speaking to. So volunteer to talk about fingerprints at high school career day. Volunteer to go to the Brownie Scouts or the Cub Scouts and give them a program on fingerprint. Call up the program directors of the civic clubs in your town, the Lions, the Optimists, the Kiwanis, Rotary. Volunteer to go do programs for them. The more exposure you get to public speaking in non-threatening situations like that, the better you will be at testimony because you're doing the same exact thing. You're explaining. Yeah. You're ex That's great advice. Yeah, you're That's explaining really good what advice. you do. Well, Pat, this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we learned a lot. And I think that for our listeners, whether you're a scientist, whether you're in the legal field, or whether you're just a true crime fan, I think that you know everybody's going to take a lot from this. So we really appreciate your time, Pat. It was great. Oh, well, I thank you. And I'd also uh, urge your listeners, if you're on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn. I post something every Monday, a war story or a little philosophy or some thoughts oh, fantastic. on uh, that I've derived out of 50 years in this business. So join me on LinkedIn, connect with me and read some of my war stories or my ideas or my philosophies there every Monday morning. I, I second that. Pat's posts are excellent. So uh, thank you so much, Pat. Hey, Dion, before I get your take on Pat and this uh, great interview, I wanted to explain an abbreviation that he used, and that's VICAP. So this is the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, and I'm just going to read straight from the FBI's website about what that is. So VICAP maintains the largest investigative repository of major violent crime cases in the U.S. It is, it is designed to collect and analyze information about homicides, sexual assaults, missing persons, and other violent crimes involving unidentified human remains. So, man, Dion, when uh, Pat was saying that the the copy was working with hadn't heard of ICAP, I mean, <laughs> that that's a big miss. So, so talk a little bit about that and some of the other takeaways that you might have had. My first takeaway is I didn't realize I was such a, you know, I don't know if it's a criminalist or a true crime nerd because I love this stuff. I mean, when you get deeper into the weeds that you go with the technique and the different styles and all that kind of stuff, I, I really enjoyed it. I was like just, you know digging everything that he was saying yeah you know i think we can all relate to fingerprints because it doesn't have some of the hardcore science that dna has and i think it's a little bit more relatable to everybody because of course fingerprints have been around forever so yeah you know, we all everybody have a basic understanding. It, understands it it's not too complicated yep. you know and i guess that kind of a, it's a great segue into my next kind of big takeaway and that is if it's not broke don't fix it and that was one of the repeating repeated themes that uh, pat was talking about about how you know, people are trained now and that he was basically talking about, you know, some of these techniques that they're not even the basic techniques are not even being taught. So there's nothing to fall back on because they don't even know how to take a basic fingerprint anymore. And that was a little scary. Yeah, it was. It sounds like maybe there was a little bit of example of like using that sledgehammer to kill a fly kind of idea. Yeah, correct. But also not not understanding the basic techniques and just going right to some kind of instrument or technique that, that kind of does it for you is always a problem. And that's an issue, I think, in, in all of forensics. I mean, you have to know the basics and the background. And this is where I think people who've been in the business of forensics, you know, definitely have the advantage, you know, in, in many ways. But uh, just having went through some of the, the harder techniques, they understand the basis of some of the new gizmos and toys that, you know, make things easier. You know, I think that um, tech is always great advancements, you know, obviously, you know, some sporting examples, you know, they've had, you know, um, you know, you can, you can challenge a call and go back and, and watch it, you know, right. umpires or refs. So that's all great. But at the end of the day, it, it's hard to replace the, the rump, the, the rumps, the, the umps or, or the referees in a game. And because there's something that they bring that, a you know, a recording, um, a video recording or something else doesn't show you. And so I just think that both should be taught. And that was kind of <laughs> what I was getting from from Pat as well, is that both of these techniques should be taught. And it's like I you hear this a lot that some of today's kids don't know how to read a, a clock with hands, a clock. You, right. You know, and that is well, he was explaining that oh, that's exactly what I was thinking. You know, so if you have someone that's, you know, 10 to 15 years old, they just see, you know digital all the time the two hands are like well they don't even know what time it is and <laughs> and that's i don't think that's good because no, what I, i'll give you another i'll give you a tennis analogy here about equipment you know let's say that i play novak djokovic you know best 
arguably the best tennis player of all time. Let's say I give him like a wooden racket from the 50s and I literally use his racket. He's still going to kick my ass every time. That's right. So, you know, I think we've obviously just scratched the surface here on, on the issue of some of the complications with fingerprinting. But um, I wanted to kind of give a parallel maybe to DNA because apparently that's all I know about. Um, but, you know, when Pat was saying the, the scientific foundation of fingerprints, um, you know, we also have to think about, well, in the if you have the perfect situation, just if you have a nice inked print on your compare to someone versus you've got a partial print it's smeared it's not the best lift in the world you know the real question is is how reliable is, is that and the parallel to, to dna is is kind of similar i mean if we're just testing somebody um we pull blood right from them and we get their dna profile you know what there's just not a lot of controversy these days i mean provided you didn't switch the sample or just get out of protocol but what if you know you you swab i don't know a door handle and you get that trickier type of sample. It's a partial profile. It's a mixture. Those are the harder ones to interpret. So maybe, you know, in future episodes, we can get a little bit more in the weeds uh, on that. But, um, you know, I think Pat did a great job of kind of giving the counter argument to some of the criticism that there is right now of fingerprinting. And, it, and I think to some degree, he's right about you cannot put that square peg in a round hole. And, you know, those of us in DNA where a lot of people are pissed at us in forensics because everybody's trying to, you know, compare to DNA and you, well, you got to have likelihood ratios and you got to have this and that. Right, so I think right. us DNA folks are, are guilty of that very often. No, I, I agree. It just seemed like, you know, it, it didn't seem like he was, you know, I don't hate to use the word dinosaur at all. He, he just like saying, Hey, you, you need both tracks, you know, because yeah. both, are only as good as the person that's that's executing them. And so I think it's always good to have a backup, you know, old school, new school, working in tandem. Yeah, and just a comment too about, you know, he was talking about like SwigFast and OSAC and basically all the bodies that provide um, recommendations on standards. And, you know, it's it's definitely, I, I think that the diversity of the committees is good in that you should have judges, other scientists, defense attorneys. But Pat's right. At the end of the day, the people who actually do the work and yeah. have been trained in it are the experts. Let, let's not forget that. Now, they need some guidance on other issues from uh, ancillary fields or satellite fields. But at the end of the day, only an expert really knows how it works. Yeah, absolutely. I had that, Actually, I thought that was a good comment as well. I think you have to have someone that's in the field who's trained in doing this on those those panels. Otherwise, I think it can go, I don't know, a little bit sideways if you don't have someone that actually understands how these things are executed. Exactly, exactly. Well, as Pat mentioned, check him out on LinkedIn. He's got excellent posts on there. Uh, and just, you know, his last name is spelled W-E-R-T-H-E-I-M. If you're interested in taking Pat's class, I actually wish wish I had the time to do that. Check out tritechtraining.com or certainly on Pat's LinkedIn. He's got a uh, link to his classes. With that, we'll say thank you and, and thanks again for joining us on Crime Redefined. And uh, we really appreciate everybody listening to us and giving us your feedback and comments. And don't forget to check us out on social media. Thank you for listening to the Crime Redefined podcast. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Crime Redefined. Please send us your comments and questions and join us for the next episode.